Okay, last day of April. I have to review aliens. Hello? Hey, Decker, it's James. I was just wondering if you wanted to join me for the next Stop the Hate. What's the topic? Porn, baby. You know, I would love to, but I really gotta review aliens now. Bye! Didn't expect him to be such a prude. Porn, baby. Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair, and today I will not let anything distract me. I'm going to review the second movie in the Alien franchise, Aliens. Decker. Ah! Who the hell are you? I'm Deus. Deus Deacon. How did you... Creepy. Anyway, I was wondering if you'd like to review Bug with me. I'd love to, but I'd really gotta review Aliens right now. Bye! Hi, Decker! Ah! Who the hell are you? I'm Des. Des Shinta? We met at Longhaired Reviewers Anonymous. Wait a minute, this is starting to sound awfully familiar. And I was wondering if you'd like to do a crossover on the topic of Eight Man. No time! Aliens review now! Bye! Decker! Ah! Who the hell are you? I'm Tim Deanna. We've talked several times. Sorry, force of habit, but listen, I've gotta... Before you go any further, I was wondering if you'd be interested in doing a crossover reviewing... No, I'm not! No matter what, I'm reviewing Aliens today! But I want to review... <sighs> and with that taken care of, let's get into the basic information about Aliens. Aliens, the sequel to Alien, came out seven years after the original film, long enough that more than enough people ended up seeing the Italian-made pseudo-sequel, Alien 2 on Earth, but never mind that. One reason it took so long is because, strangely enough, the studio wanted to do a good job and felt that James Cameron was the perfect man for the job, making many accommodations for his busy schedule at the time. They also were convinced that they absolutely had to have Sigourney Weaver reprise her role as Ripley. There's already so much that's been said about aliens and so much trivia out there, and that review I did a couple of years ago, so what could I possibly have to say about the Blu-ray release other than the fact that there are more pixels? Well, a lot, actually. For starters, this isn't a faithful reproduction. No, they didn't go George Lucas style and change the order things took place in, except the couple continuity errors, but certain shots have been digitally modified to hide errors in cinematography. On top of that, strangely enough, this is not the special edition, so 17 minutes worth of the film is no longer there, reducing this release to the theatrical version's mere 2 hour 17 minute running time. But who cares about the special edition anyway? I mean, aside from Sigourney Weaver, who threatened to never work on the series again unless they added back those scenes with her mother playing her daughter, but... Anyway, let's take a look at Aliens and hope that this gets uploaded before too many more angry letters are written calling for my best hair on a pike. The film opens to the shuttle from Alien being opened as it was discovered floating adrift in space, just as Ripley hoped. Except it took a bit longer than intended. Fifty-seven years. What? This is what happens when you leave the Kerbal computer in charge of navigation. In accordance with horror movie law, they brought back the important character from the first film only to die in the opening scene. However, in accordance with alien law, Ripley must be the star, so it was all just a dream! Which is fine by me. Think about it. Ripley survives whatever horrors are thrown at her only to be magically impregnated between movies? Who would write something like that? Instead, we find out that the company was none too pleased to find out their rather expensive spacecraft was blown up. Especially when Ripley's story is, uh, less than believable. A creature that gestates inside a living human host. Yes. These are your words. And has concentrated acid for blood. That's right. And it has a mouth in its tongue. Yeah. And fucked Lambert to death. Will you try explaining that scene? Strangely enough, they remain unconvinced, especially considering what's been going on with LV-426 for the last half century. There have been people there for over 20 years, and they never complained about any hostile organism. What do you mean? What people? I don't know, 60, maybe 70 families. Do you mind? And yet, in all this time, they never bothered checking that derelict spacecraft just over the hill with that transmission signal that can be homed in on, because, uh, plot! 
Obviously, Ripley is horrified at the twist in this horror movie, but don't worry, the company's representative, Burke, played by Paul Reiser, is there to ask her something. Hi, Ripley. This is Lieutenant Gorman of the Colonial Marine Corps. Thus, Ripley avoids the alien menace entirely. The end. Actually, upon hearing they lost contact with the colony, she lets them in to learn they actually want to bring her back to the planet as a consultant. Still, she's not stupid or particularly enthused about the prospect of being chased down by a killer alien yet again, but Burke brings up the fact that because she is not exactly seen as mentally stable, her career opportunities are currently quite limited. What would you say if I told you I could get you reinstated as a flight officer? The company has already agreed to pick up your contract. If I go. Yeah, if you go. Hmm, so I could get back the pay and position that I should have had in the first place, but first I have to put myself in harm's way with about a 100% chance of dying horribly. I swear, Wayland Utani is the perfect retail corporation. Still, she doesn't want to hear it and tells him to leave. However, that hasn't cured her nightmares, and we all know there is only one remedy for nocturnal terrors. Naked Burke. Ripley. Okay. The future camera phone that is an anything but portable, horrible, low-quality CRT screen may be silly, but the fact that people are stupid enough to answer it before even putting pants on, well, that's believable. Just tell me one thing, Burke. You're going out there to destroy them, right? Not to study. Not to bring back. <laughs> yeah, because the best way to combat a threat is by having no fucking idea what it is. Regardless, he assures her they only want to kill aliens, so she agrees to come along. This transitions directly over to the Sulaco, and our stars for this film awakening from their cryosleep. Most notably, Bill Paxton as Hudson, Michael Biehn as Hicks, and Jeanette Goldstein as Vasquez. Hey, Mira. Who's Snow White? She's supposed to be some kind of consultant. Apparently, she saw an alien once. <laughs> Whoopie fucking do. <laughs> Based on this and other lines in this film, it would seem that alien life is actually not all that uncommon in the alien universe. Of course, games based around this movie took those lines and tried to make it seem like Marines fighting aliens was a common occurrence, which this film shows is certainly not the case. Of course, I must also mention Lance Henriksen as Bishop, the android, a good role that helped show off his acting prowess, and as legend has it, was also instrumental in him deciding to continue his career as an actor. We see that Bishop is knowledgeable, a little creepy, but more than willing to get up close and personal with the Marines. Trust me. As legend has it, Bill didn't know that they were going to pull him in to participate in that little stunt. And they also had to reshoot it the next day, so... Well, at that point he probably saw it coming. A nick on his finger reveals his identity to Ripley, though, which doesn't go over well as they didn't bother to mention they had a synthetic with them. I prefer the term artificial person myself. Really? Well, that sounds more intolerant to me. That's literally saying that your personhood is simply not real. Therefore, their rocky relationship is established, as well as the name everyone picked up for the alien. A xenomorph may be involved. Excuse me, sir. A, a what? A xenomorph. Which, for all intents and purposes, is actually just a fancy way of saying alien. The creature, to this day, is effectively unnamed. That's not important, though. We have to establish things for later, like the loading airlock set safely in the floor, the existence of power loaders, the fact that Ripley knows how to operate said power loaders, and that she wears Reebok sneakers. Ah, 80s product placement. Made all the more confusing with the fact that Wayland Utani owns fucking everything. As my review is taking way too much time on the small shit, let's jump right down to the planet, shall we? After touching down and braving the rainstorm to hack the door into the colony, once inside they find that, very strangely, they are mostly dry. Oh, and the whole place is horrifyingly destroyed. Looks melted. Somebody must have bagged one of Ripley's bad guys here. That's it for blood. Yeah, it's huge and proves Ripley was right, but am I the only one disappointed that we didn't actually get to see any of the fight? I... 
All I want is to watch hundreds of innocent people die horribly being torn apart by monsters. Is that so wrong? As nothing is trying to kill them right this second, hey, that means it's secure enough, so let's head in. It doesn't take long to discover the facehuggers in the med lab, along with the notes about how the removal killed the patients. No time to dwell, though. They've detected something on their motion tracker. Kill it! Kill it with fire! Kill it anyway! This introduces us to Carrie Hearn as Newt, who effectively takes over Ripley's old character role as the lone survivor, as during that awesome colony killing scene that never took place, evidently nobody else on the planet figured out that the best course of action may just be to run and hide. Where are they? They're dead. All right, can I go now? Also, this scene strangely works better when that scene of her face-hugged father is omitted from the film. It's a little less shocking when you already certainly know at least one of them are dead. In any case, she can't go, but Hudson finds a group of colonists tracking beacons, so the team goes forth to save them. However, before they go too far, they find the very obvious signs of the alien hive. Looks like some sort of secreted resin. Yeah. But secreted from what? Nobody touch nothing. Oh! Uh, okay, sir! <laughs> no problem! More of a problem, Ripley figures their weapons may be dangerous to fire so near the cooling stations of the atmospheric generator, and Burke is quick to support her conclusion. Look, this whole station is basically a big fusion reactor. Right? So, you're talking about a thermonuclear explosion and adios muchachos. Oh, great. So, fall back, re-strategize, and then save the colonists? Nope, just confiscate everyone's ammunition. What the hell are we supposed to use, man? Harsh language? Mm, works for James Rolfe. The magazines are collected, but when several characters happen to have backup weapons or spare secret clips, nobody notices. Possibly because something else catches their attention. Decker! <laughs> Heart! Oh, good, I have a moment. Listen, Decker. I have sent you plenty of requests to do crossovers, and I think your fans would appreciate something that's a little... Less creepy. No time, Tim, no time! I still gotta finish the Aliens review! Now just hold on a second! Anyway, where were we? <laughs> Heart! So we get our chestburster scene, which in and of itself is not nearly as shocking as it was in the first. Partly because we've seen it, and also the fact that there wasn't much build-up. But fortunately, the scene continues. This was just the spark to ignite the flame, as we see that an ungodly quantity of aliens are closing in on the Marines, despite the fact that even with infrared, they can't spot them. So rather than let us dwell on the disappointing chestburster, the film doesn't slow down at all and gets right into the big first fight with the aliens. Let's rock! <laughs> it's funny because Vasquez rocks. Gorman, played by William Hope, proves to be a spineless, useless sack of shit as his indecisiveness helps get the majority of the Marines killed off. It ends up being Ripley who has to take charge of the situation, driving right into the action to save what few she can, which by the time they drive to safety turns out to be no more than Hicks, Hudson, and Vasquez. The most interesting characters! How convenient! Anyway, I suppose Al Matthews was pretty damn awesome as a pawn. Oh well. So, new strategy. I say we take off and nuke the entire site from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. Eh, not too sure. I mean, what if there are some aliens in bomb shelters? Also, this is assuming that these are the only aliens in the universe. These aliens that were on that spacecraft that you yourself said came from elsewhere. How sure was that again? Sure enough for Hicks, who, as the one in charge now, chooses exactly the same course of action, so the transport comes to pick them up. Well, but that's too easy! Well, where the fu- Much better. We better get back, because it'll be dark soon, and they mostly come at night. Mostly.
A famous line for many reasons, but I'll discuss the hint of the English accent. Actually, the actress was a born American, it's just she was living in England at the time, which is what they were looking for because they were producing it in England for an American audience. It just so happens that kids tend to pick up the accents of the places they're living. Hmm? Who'd have thought? So, new crisis. They must survive 17 days to be declared missing long enough for a rescue team to be notified. 17 days? Hey man, I don't want to rain on your parade, but we're not going to last 17 hours. Those things are going to come in here just like they did before, and they're going to come in here, and they're going to come in here, and they're going to get us! And Hudson begins losing his shit. More so than he has up to this point. Still, Ripley keeps him in line, and they seal off all the entrances to their location without much difficulty. Here, I want you to put this on. What's it for? It's a locator. Then I can find you anywhere in the complex on this. Ah, thanks for introducing that miscellaneous gadget to us, Hicks. I'm sure it'll come in very handy later. Such as in the following scene when Ripley is putting Newt to bed and needs to figure out some way to keep her feelings safe. Take this. For luck. Well, just hope for your sake, Ripley, that an alien doesn't grab your ass and drag you into the vents and then Hicks wastes five minutes tracking Newt. But waiting it out in complete safety with no conflicts is far too boring, so we learn that Burke has specifically ordered Bishop to keep the jarred facehuggers alive for the transport home. To ensure that she will certainly be the target of whatever it is he's planning next, Ripley chastises the man not only for this, but because she happened to be snooping around and discovered that he sent an order to the colonists to search the suspected crash site of the derelict spaceship. These people are dead, Burke! Don't you have any idea what you've done here? Well, I'm going to make sure that they nail you right to the wall for this. You're not going to sleaze your way out of this one. Right to the wall. As soon as we get back to home base. Assuming nothing horrible happens to me during this trip, and you don't do anything to sabotage my cryopod, and we get home safely, THEN YOU'LL BE SORRY! Of course, yet another crisis pops up, as their erratic firing earlier did in fact damage the cooling tanks, so the overheating atmospheric generator has become a ticking atomic bomb. How long till it blows? Four hours. Hmm. With a blast radius of 30 kilometers. 30 kilometers? <laughs> Compared to the 50 megaton star Obama, that ain't shit. So, they're royally fucked. As such, Hudson begins losing his shit for the umpteenth time, but Bishop volunteers to go alone to the colony's uplink towers and fly the second shuttle down by remote. I mean, I'm the only one qualified to remote pilot the ship anyway. Yeah, right, man. Bishop should go. Good idea. Believe me, I'd prefer not to. I may be synthetic, but I'm not stupid. Uh, quick question. Uh, would the aliens bother to do anything to him anyway? I may take victims for hosts, which... He is useless for us, so uh, what's he worried about? He's gonna get some nasty looks? Continuing to prepare for the climax, Hicks just so happens to think it'd be fun to teach Ripley about all the friendly, peacekeeping functions of the pulse rifle. After this is done, we take note that Gorman has regained consciousness, so that means it's ample time for Ripley to lose hers, heading off to nap with Newt. It's not like anything can go wrong now. Oh yeah, that guy you pissed off, even though you already knew he was willing to kill hundreds of people, including innocent women and children, just for a higher paycheck. That little problem. Oh. In a clear sign that, yes, it is Burke trying to kill them, the doors are locked, the pulse rifle was moved out of the room, and in case that's not a big enough hint, Burke himself is seen turning off the surveillance of the room. Somewhere out there, there's a businessman watching this saying, Oh, come on, you prejudicial assholes! Quick thinking and a lighter allow Ripley to activate the sprinkler system, alerting the Marines to a potential fire in the med lab. After they show up and deal with the real threat, Ripley explains that it was Burke responsible. Sort of. Honestly, she pulls some stuff out of her ass not at all different than your average conspiracy theorist. Nobody would know about the embryos we were carrying. Wait a minute now, we don't know. Yes, the only way he could do it is if he sabotaged certain freezers on the way home. Namely yours. Right. Listen to what you're saying. It's paranoid delusion. How... It's really sad. Yeah, I know it's what he was actually planning, but taking this scene on its own, he's the one that comes off as the sane one. Or, or the least insane one. 
All right, we waste him. No offense. Right in front of the little girl. Our hero, ladies and gentlemen. Fortunately, this course of action is interrupted. Unfortunately, that's because there's a shitload of aliens coming, and they just now realize that there is a massive gap in their barricade. So run like hell, until Burke locks the door, leaving them all to die. Don't worry, though, he doesn't get far. Another kill people were disappointed I did not bring up in the top 10 Xenomorph kills. And while I admit he was probably the most deserving to die in the entire franchise, it was a cutaway death, and personally I find those disappointing. In the ensuing chaos, Hudson is kill... uh... isn't killed, just temporarily separated by aliens. Gorman and Vasquez don't make it through the journey in the ducts, and Newt gets separated as well. Come on, we can find her with this! When the fuck did Ripley ever tell you that she put the tracker on Newt? They do find her, around the same time an alien does, so, uh... Whoops. No! They don't kill you! They, they don't kill you! They... Oh, yes, they do! Well, maybe not immediately, but it is a pretty big reason to fear them. This is to set up the climax, as after Hicks is injured by acid spray, Ripley must head back in with very little time to spare in an attempt to save Newt. It's a good scene to showcase the culmination of Ripley's character growth in this film, but what most of us really like from this is the big reveal of the Queen Alien. At 1 hour and 57 minutes. <laughs> Some people complained they didn't see the alien enough in the first movie. She's smart enough to realize that maybe she shouldn't fuck with the woman with the flamethrower. Then again, maybe just fuck with her a little? From this scene we learn that Sigourney Weaver has one hell of a bitch look. So it's time for some fried eggs. This transitions into Ripley having to run like hell out of an installation before it explodes while being hunted by a horrifying alien. Now, you'd think that kind of event wouldn't happen all that often in someone's life. Still, she manages to escape via the elevator. Unfortunately for her, Wailing View tiny lifts are inconveniently convenient. Still, Bishop flies in and scoops him up in the nick of time. And why exactly was he not simply waiting at the landing pad like he said he was going to? I'm sorry if I scared you. That platform was just becoming too unstable. I had to circle and hope that things didn't get too rough to take you off. Oh, don't give me that shit! You know, I've got a right mind to... <laughs> Never mind. Looks like Queenie's got this one for me. Yeah, she also happened to escape the presumed climax, but look on the bright side. We get to see the power loader again, and hear the classic line. Get away from her, you bitch! A simple yet powerful line that has been burned into our memories. Only to be ruined decades later in a direct TV ad. Get away from her, you... This thing just won't leave. All I want to do is kick back and enjoy the direct TV we just hooked up. Never mind that, though. The point is, the power loader battle works for many reasons. Aside from being awesome mecha technology versus giant alien creature, it evens the playing field between the Queen and Ripley, giving us a very tense one-on-one -on -one combat. This is gonna feel almost as good as when I got rid of Cable. Aside from the joys of telling Comcast at GTFO, we do learn some interesting things about the physics of the alien universe here as well. For instance, while the vacuum of space is strong enough to suck an alien queen off of whatever she's holding onto, human arms are supernaturally resilient to breakage. Also, pressurization systems and spaceships are so powerful, they keep blasting air into space indefinitely until the doors shut. Not bad for a human. <laughs> yeah, not bad, but a predator would have just sucker punched the queen and teabagged her. Well, that second party would probably regret. Anyway, happy ending! Ripley packs everyone for cold storage, including Hicks, who is still alive, just hasn't been awake for the last 20 or so minutes of film. And they set course to return to Earth. Which has not been ruined by the knowledge that any horrible thing happens along the way. No, nope. It hasn't. I was initially disappointed to find out that the Blu-ray included in Alien Anthology was in fact the theatrical version and not the special edition, but now I'm actually kind of glad that it was, mainly because I'm more capable at this point of comparing the two, and honestly, for my money, I feel the theatrical release was balanced better. 
Sure, we don't see the colony before the destruction at all in this version, but not only did that help keep the mystery of what happened before they arrived unknown, we got to see them arrive that much faster. Learning about Ripley's daughter was interesting, but didn't really add anything. Plus, if you go by how long I said trips took in the first film, to this one saying Ripley promised she'd be back for her 11th birthday, she'd have to give that kid that promise when she was 7. Or younger. What this film is left with is great action, very good acting, memorable characters, and damn nice pacing. Remember that scene I complained about in the special edition with the sentry guns? The gripping drama of watching numbers change on a screen? Yeah, that's not in here either, and I couldn't be happier about that. Aliens changes a lot about the aliens in question, as they're not nearly as slow as the first film. They're still much slower than later movies, but what changes we do get aren't so bad that it's a completely different beast, and who doesn't like the Queen Alien? Well, I suppose Newt doesn't, but that's besides the point. Aliens is a well-paced action film that has just enough horror overtones so the big heroes never feel invincible, and it really works overall, coming in at five pulse rifles out of five. Now, screw that old rating system I was trying where I was separately rating the action and horror elements of the film. I mean, it was too clunky, complicated, and unnecessary. Hooray for Occam's Razor! Thank you all for watching, I've been Dega Shadow, and remember, Vasquez rocks! Ah, Tim, sorry for cutting you off earlier. Now, you said you wanted to do a crossover? Yes. Alright, what did you have in mind for a crossover? Aliens. Oh. Um. Sorry about that. I... Well, um, maybe... No, Decker, that tears it. I lost it on Prometheus. I didn't get to be a part of you and creepy Halloween adventure, didn't even get to be in a cameo. Now this, and you think you're just gonna push me aside so you can have another video with Creepy? I don't think so. Not this time. We're doing this crossover, now sit down! But I'm already sitting. Well, do it! Alright, so what horrible blockbuster do we have to sit through? Actually, nothing of the kind. You see, you and I are going to embark on a subject that can only be described with this foreshadowing sound effect. You do realize I was going to review Godzilla anyways. Well, yeah, but this was much cooler. Looks like love at first sight to me.